Hey everybody, Darren Rose here. Today I sat down with fellow Alberta and Lori May Paroff, and Lori May walked us through how to diversify your real estate investing portfolio in order to mitigate risk. Lori May uses short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies in conjunction with one another so that her portfolio is always rolling over, and she's able to pivot on a dime should one of her strategies become less effective. I'm a big fan of diversifying your investment portfolio in general, and inside of our real estate investing portfolio, it's important to avoid having all of our eggs in one basket. So Lori May and I will talk about how we set up our portfolios in order to get a balanced and consistent return. Before we get into it, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everybody, today I'm here with Lori May, a good friend of mine that I've known for a couple of years. I've actually known of Lori May for, for many years. Her reputation preceded her. I finally got a chance to meet her in person a couple of years ago at an event that I was speaking at, and she did a little bit of a guest appearance there for me as well. So it's so nice to connect with her again uh, via you know the Zoom media that we've all been doing, and I just wanted to touch base with Lori May today and ask her all about how she's able to diversify her portfolio because she does so many things and she does them so well. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we protect ourselves, what we want to have in our portfolio in terms of long-term investments and short-term investments. Lori May, uh, great to have you here. Why don't you give everyone a little bit of a backstory on who you are and what you do? Hey, Darren, thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, I think that meeting that we met at uh, where you were speaking was uh, when my daughter came out too. So That's that right. was pretty exciting yeah. for uh, for our family to get to meet you live and in person. Of course, we've seen you on HGTV too, so it's kind of kind of fun, a little flat <laughs> moment. Uh, yeah, so background, I came from uh, nowhere in terms of investing, uh, absolutely nowhere. I was a college uh, teacher. I taught Microsoft Office to first year students who didn't think they needed any else. Um, but I have found that having those sorts of things are, are beneficial to having them um, having the ability to talk people into doing things that they may or may not want to do <laughs> isn't a, isn't a non-transferable skill, let's just put it that way. Mm. Um, when I came in, I had, I think like most people have, uh, a few dollars uh, saved in RSPs, which were working in mutual funds. I did also have some unregistered funds working again in mutual funds and in stocks, and that's pretty much how my portfolio looked at that time and since then I wanted to uh, I got a little inheritance I wanted to make sure that I didn't just kind of blow it all so I thought well I'm not really ready to be a landlord I'll buy a new construction condo it's going to take a couple of years and I can figure it out between now and then so that's kind of how it started then I joined a national network and uh, through them kind of exploded out of that um, and from there, I've done a lot of portfolio balancing and, and diversification to make sure that all the eggs aren't in one basket, that uh, multiple income streams with multiple timings for coming out, uh, long-term wealth, short-term wealth. I like to eat Cheerios today, but I want to make sure my family's protected tomorrow, all that sort of stuff. And so what is, uh, you know, what is your best uh, sort of advice, I guess, in terms of setting up let's talk let's talk short term first what are you doing right now in order to be able to uh, set yourself up set yourself up for short term success in, in real estate investing there's a couple of different strategies i use for that of course buying old rentals you're getting fairly decent cash flow so i'm looking for rentals that can generate that sort of income as well i like to do private lending bridge financing is a terrific one in order to make very quick money in very short periods of time a bridge finance can go anywhere from three days to three months very, very short. Um, I'll also work with some flippers. As you get to know some people that like to flip houses for cash, you come in with the renovation budget and that really helps to, to move some things along. So those are my primary strategies for, for short-term cash. What scenarios are presented in terms of bridge financing? Where are those people, where are you finding them and where are they coming to find you? Where am I finding them? Gee, it's through a lot of networking for the most part. So there's two main scenarios that happen with bridge financing. Uh, number one would be um, a builder going to do a big project or uh, somebody trying to close on a home and they have a, a JV partner coming in with RSP money. Well, as we all know, it can take time to get that RSP money from where it is today over to the proper uh, institution in order to be able to self-direct it to the project. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the amount of time that that takes is miscalculated. So in order to close on time, the uh, JV partner now needs somebody to swoop in with some big cash and close it 
and they don't need it very long. The money's on the way, but it might be, as I say, anywhere from three days to three months. Uh, the other one that happens pretty quickly is the flipping. That's uh, that's uh, bridge finance that can happen quite often in that the bank needs some additional information before they'll advance the money. Um, and the flipper just needs to have it closed and ready to go now because he has trades coming in. So we'll close it today and it, that's usually under a week. It's just out and back in. Would you have midterm sort of uh, strategies and then long term or would you just skip then to sort of more, sort of more of those long term <laughs> strategies? Uh, midterm strategies are usually um, flips or people that are doing flip to self tech uh, uh, techniques, uh, birds, that yep. sort of thing. Uh, so a number of those out there. Uh, second mortgages as well, those can be usually anywhere from a year to three years. Um, and some land development projects are pretty quick. So those would be my midterms. Are you using a lot of registered funds in terms of these uh, private lending situations? Uh, are you trying to use RSPs, TFSAs, Lira's RIFs, all of that when you're, when you're looking at those sort of middle uh, midterm opportunities? Um, even the short term, sometimes if, the, if it's already in position in cash, yeah. uh, generally speaking, uh, RSPs go on the longer term ones. I think like most people, I'm a little on the lazy side. So if I find a good deal and it's going to get parked and set it and forget it for a while, I prefer to use that for the registered funds. Uh, the cash, um, it's not liquid cash anyway, even if it comes back quickly, what the heck am I going to do with it? It's stuck in that stupid RSP vehicle. So I will use uh, cash generally for my uh, for my shorter term opportunities mm -hmm. and the midterm opportunities is a bit of a mix. So how do you protect your um, your capital essentially in a situation where you've got somebody who wants to do a burst strategy or a flip to yourself, something like that? You know, are you uh, doing promissory notes with a personal guarantee or are you doing a, you know, something registered against the title? Like how do you protect your money when it's out there? So I have three main strategies there. Yes. So I, yes, I have done uh, secured against title, either title of the property they're working on or title on something else that they own that they have equity and room in. Mm -hmm. um, I've done uh, the promissory note with personal guarantee or a loan agreement with uh, personal guarantee. And I've done some unsecured as well. Um, obviously different amounts of risks in each and generally speaking your interest rates are varied based on the amount of risks so um, I don't mind mixing a few high risk into my equation but I consider that in the Vegas money so if it gets lost it's I can still eat tonight uh, so never put more into unsecured high risk than you can afford to lose. You mentioned the midterm land development stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are you seeing in that maybe one to three year range in terms of land development? Would that be some of your builder relationships you have? Or are you actually working with syndicated uh, larger land development projects on that one to three year term? Again, I have both. <laughs> so I do have a syndicated project that I'm working with um, as part of in, um, in the BC area. Uh, here in the Edmonton area, our land development projects are anywhere from eight months to, to four years, depending on whether we're doing a single family home, if we're doing it out of shipping containers or traditional build, um, or if we're doing uh, land assembly into apartment builds with rezoning required. They're going to be anywhere in that range. Yeah, let's talk about long term now. We mentioned sort of short term, mid term. What are you doing to, to set yourself up for uh, your long term investments? I mean, we've talked a little bit about buy and hold. Obviously, that's a, a long term strategy. But what else are you doing? My other long terms would be land development as well, but uh, with um, a more of a syndicated approach. So we're looking at these um, planned community developments, that sort of thing happening. Uh, not so much here, mostly in Ontario, a little bit in the States. And do you, have a, do you have a percentage amount of your portfolio that you like to dedicate to certain elements to feel like you have a, a really diversified portfolio? I do, actually, yeah. I try to balance it. I'm going to say quarters. So about a quarter in the stock market, about a quarter to my long-term buy-in holds, about a quarter into short-term cash financing. And then I like to see about a quarter of mine coming from income income through either consulting or my husband's income or whatever. What would be your best advice to new investors getting into real estate? How, how can they set themselves up for being diversified? 
So I'm going to actually approach this a little bit differently. What is it you want to do when you're in, in the real estate game? If you're going to be a working partner, I think it's very important that you set a narrow niche, a very narrow tunnel, get very good at doing one thing and get recognized for that one thing. So that when I come along and think I'd like to invest in something like what you're doing, you come to my mind first. As you are successful there, you're going to be hopefully amassing some income <laughs> and that income you're going to want to start to diversify and put into different different avenues. So I would say um, to start out, you're going to want to have a very good understanding of your risk tolerance um, because different opportunities come with different amounts of risk and be very careful not to put um, that bright shiny one that pays 22% interest, don't put absolutely every egg into that basket. Make sure that you're spread amongst several different baskets, that you have different um, regions, different durations, different people that you're working with, different partners, keep things, keep things varied. And that way you'll have um, less chance of having a, a catastrophic event. If you do unfortunately experience a loss, and that can happen from time to time in real estate investing, you want to make sure that that loss is, is offset by income coming in from other areas. When you come across other investors that, that have a lot of experience in real estate investing, and they are sort of in one specific category, what's, what's your advice to those people? Like you've obviously diversified for a reason. And why, why do you feel like you are able to have so many strategies that, strategies that you can be successful at? I think, I think I have a little bit of OCD, perhaps. <laughs> I just, um, I want to learn about various strategies. So like even, even in my buy and hold rentals, I have the exec condos, the furnished condos I've done, uh, rentals, traditional rentals, agreement for sale. <laughs> I even mix up within that particular um, geography. I understand that some people don't. Some people get very, very, very good at what they do and they drill straight down and they don't they stay in their lane, so to speak. Mm. Um, good for you. I just would be concerned that perhaps an unexpected event could occur and your lane might get disrupted. So try to try to diversify at least a little bit. Do you have a favorite strategy that, that you just get really excited about more so than other ones? I know that you want to stay diversified, but is there something that you're really passionate about? Every day of the week, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> Right now I'm into suiting homes because that's what I'm working on right now. I bought a duplex that I'm trying to turn into a fourplex. Um, I, I recently just thought the world ended with this bridge financing stuff because saw some really good returns there. I just, yeah, it changes a lot. I've been into shipping containers big time for quite a while. I like, I uh, like building with those. So you name it. I, I like to, I like to play in it. Did you have opportunities presented to you and then you sort of figured out a way to make that opportunity work or did you pursue the investment strategy first and then look at, uh, you know, creating an opportunity for that investment strategy? Does that make sense? Is that, is that a, like, you understand? I would say more the opportunity pops up and then, then you figure out a way to make it happen. Um, right. if, if it excites you and ignites you, then yes. Because I think a lot of investors do that where you say they, they've got one strategy that they focus on and there could be a tremendous opportunity that's presented in front of them, but they say, well, I only do this one thing. And so they kind of turn off that, that, that you know, part of their brain, if you will. But I think what you're doing is you're saying, look, I was presented X, Y, and Z. And instead of just focusing on X, I looked at how I made X, Y, and Z work and it's been very successful for you. Things can morph on you too. An example that I'm thinking of, I started to work with a specific builder as his financer for a renovation budget. He's a flipper. We never actually wound up flipping a property. We it wound up to be easier just to demolish the property and put up a new, new house. So we wound up kind of doing land development that way. From there, we wound up doing shipping container builds. And from there, we wound up in apartment builds. So things just kind of exploded with, I don't want to say without a whole lot of thought, there was definitely thought and conversation and planning that went into everything, but sometimes things just morph on you quickly. <laughs> What's your next sort of venture that you have coming up? Is there something that's uh, approaching now that's maybe coming due? One of these short, medium, long-term investments, and are you going to roll that back into the same kind of investment or are you going to diversify that money somewhere else? 
I'd like to revisit the portfolio. Um, we do a major, major, major portfolio analysis uh, once a year, but I do high level analysis probably every three months. Um, so I'm coming up due for another one and I'm going to use the funds that I do have coming in from another project to rebalance myself because I feel like I'm getting a little bit out of whack here. Any advice, I guess, for investors uh, out there right now that with the, with the success that you've had, uh, something that you feel has been really the key to being able to diversify and uh, not put all of your eggs in one basket? Yeah, networking. Networking is the big deal. Getting to know people that are out there. And um, one thing that I found very interesting is people will toss out that they have some time available in their calendar or they would like to talk. And it's, it's amazing how few people actually take advantage of that, especially these days. There's a lot more people having the opportunity to say, hey, call me up and, and let me book an appointment. So uh, do that. Pick pick the brains of people that are doing things that you want to do. And it's easier to figure out how to proceed and how to build your own portfolio if you're picking the brains of somebody else who's already done it. That's great advice. And I, and, and you've been very good at this, just, you know, staying with your finger on the pulse of, of so many communities that you belong to and just making yourself, you know, available to people and also making people aware that, you know, of what you do. And, and I think that's really powerful because I see people reaching out to you on a regular basis and wanting to work with you and work beside you for sure. Thanks so much again. Anything else you, any final thoughts you want to add? Absolutely. Have a sweet day. (laughs) I love it. I hope you guys enjoyed my conversation with Lori May. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. And with that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.